<laughs> hey everybody, welcome to church. I am Sarah Berger. For those of you who don't know me, I'm the campus director here, and uh, my dad is Doc, and he is on a well-deserved vacation with my mama. They are watching online right now, so let's welcome them in in an awesome way. I, uh, God is just, like, he's awesome to me. I was preparing for this sermon all week, and I heard someone somewhere down the road say, preparing a sermon is like you're wrestling all week. You're just wrestling to try to get these concepts and these ideas and how God has, like, worked in your life and what you know to be true, and you're just wrestling with it. And um, this one was a wrestle for me. And of all things, I'm preaching on joy. Remember when I said next chance, I'm preaching on joy? Well, then I wrestled all week long. And I was like, what on earth is going on? And I saw the playlist. I asked Lex, I was like, what are you guys doing for the worship set? Because worship has always been a big piece of um, how I connect with God. And it was the Revelation song. And I don't think anyone knows this, but this was like a moment in my life when I was truly struggling to find joy. I was, Jacob and I were so dirt poor. I mean, we were just newlyweds. We were as poor as you could be. Um, like, how can I sell clothes to maybe make money for groceries poor? I mean, we were dirt poor. And our marriage was rough, and we had two babies kind of just right away, and then the third came, and then I thought I was poor, but then I was really, really poor. And um, we were just struggling, and like my ministry, I was working up here in Kid Venture, leading the kids' ministry, and it was like, it was just a struggle. Anyone ever been in that time where it was like, nothing's coming easy, and I could really use some joy? And I remember um, this, this worship song at the time. I would just go and I would just spend time with God and I would just sing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. And I would just sing it on repeat because I just had to tell myself who God was. I just had to tell myself that I wasn't in this alone. And I think so often we can feel so alone in life. I, I love the things, you've probably heard of this, where people will say, like, um, happiness and joy, they're different because happiness is what happens around you, but joy is what happens within you. And I believe that. You might have heard people say, choose joy, choose it. And every part of me knows that that is true until it's not. <laughs> There are so many obstacles to joy. There are so many things that can uh, get in the way. My daughters and I, the guys, like Jake said, they all went out on a um, camping adventure yesterday, the Wild at Heart camping adventure. And it was just me and my girls. And the boys are the most fun human beings, okay? Jacob, Christian, Jeremiah, they are like joy and adventure. And it was like joy and adventure had left the building, and the girls were left to figure out what the heck are we going to do to have a little bit of fun. Boys are like climbing down mountains, throwing axes, and I was like, well, I guess we could play cards. <laughs> Um, but the boys had like left and the girls are like, okay, we are choosing joy. We're moving to the joy. And um, I was struggling with my sermon and I was hoping it would be done so we could get up, we could go get coffee, we could go for a walk in Hinkley. But it was like taking me way longer. I couldn't button this thing up. And uh, the girls are like, come on, let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go. And I was like, all right, let's go. So we get in the car, I go the wrong way, I have to turn around. I have the smallest cup holders in the history of cup holders. I know this is not a big deal, but to me, I forget, and the only water bottles we have in my house, ladies, I don't know if everyone has seen the Stanley Cup, it's about yay big, yay big. So my daughter, who's pregnant, brings the Stanley Cup or something like it, and I take a turn and the whole thing spills everywhere, like lid pops off and, um, we get to the hiking place, and I'm like, yes, we're going to go enjoy adventure and walk in the beauty of God's creation because we are choosing joy. And then my pregnant daughter, can we just look at my granddaughter for a minute? 
<laughs> my daughter's pregnant. She hates being it publicly. Like it's, she hates it. So don't say anything to her. But <laughs> the cutest baby you've ever seen in all your life. Jake's like, how can you tell? I was like, because we've seen her picture and she's beautiful and perfect in every way. What do you mean, how can I tell? <laughs> okay, so we get to the, the nature of Jesus and we're gonna walk and it's gonna be so good. And I just forget how hard this little path is that I picked. And Lexi's like more than halfway pregnant. Her lungs are, you know, working a little extra hard. She's breathing deep. And then the hill arrives. And it's like a hill that's a hill. It's like you're going to bend forward when you walk it. You know what I'm saying? And she's huffing and huffing. And I was like, man, we're trying to choose joy. But it's like every time we're trying to choose it, something is fighting against it. Does anyone have an amen in this room or online? Amen. And I've been studying and studying and studying, and I was like, what really pulled me out of some of the hardest times in my life? Because here's the deal. Joy comes kind of naturally to me. I wake up in the morning, and I'm like, Hallelujah, mama's alive. Like I'm singing, I'm naturally very happy when I wake up. Some other people in my family, not so much. I'm singing, I'm dancing. My husband, and maybe this girl right here, my daughter, <laughs> they're like, we need a good hour before you start in with all that. Anyone else like that in here? You give me a good hour before we start in on all that. And uh, here's the thing. I think when we think about joy, some of us are hardwired differently. That's okay. Because what we're going to talk about today is if joy is truly a choice, if, if joy is a choice, I want to think about it just a little bit different. I want to think about it as joy is a focus. Because, man, I've tried to choose joy, and it hasn't worked sometimes, although I believe it's true. But I think if it's joy is the choice, then I think the choice is what we focus on. Amen? Joy is a focus. I was thinking a lot last year about this idea that if you knew without one doubt, one teeny ounce of doubt in your mind that God is real, that Jesus is who he said he is, what would you be willing to do different. If you truly believe that there was a God of the universe who loved you, who chose you, who has created you for joy, who has created you for a life, what would you be willing to do that you're not doing right now? If you were at CC Midweek, shout out CC Midweek, our Wednesday night once a month service. We talked about this idea of like, it's why God part two. And we talked about this idea of um, why God allows like the hard stuff to happen. And what do you do when you're not just disappointed in life, but you're kind of disappointed in God, like that he let that happen. And so if you're interested, you can go on their CC Midweek YouTube and check that out, or I think it's on our website. It's called, called Why God Part Two. But in it, we talked about Lazarus. And in John 11, there's a man named Lazarus. He's got two sisters, Mary and Martha. And there is this scene in John 11 that the girls, the sisters, send out to Jesus and say, Lazarus is sick. Actually, they don't even say his name. They just say, the one you love is sick. And they had a full expectation that Christ was going to show up because these were his friends. I love seeing, like, okay, God... Jesus chose them to be friends with. Like, you get to choose your friends, and he chose them. So I always think, like, what's it about them? They must be so cool. Like, I want to know them more. And so Jesus sends to them, or the girls send to Jesus, hey, the one you love is sick. And the Bible does this really funny thing. John says, because he loved them, he waited two days to go. And you see this moment of, God showing his love in a way that we never expected it. You see, he let Lazarus die. And his sisters were deeply disappointed. 
And they weren't disappointed because they lacked faith. They were disappointed because they believed that he could and he didn't. And you see, Mary was so stuck on what he didn't do that it was hard for her to even get past it, for her to even think, what could he possibly do? She was stuck in the pain of, God, if you were here, Jesus, if you were here, my brother would not have died. And she was stuck in it. And I feel like for some of us, we are stuck in a space that is robbing us of joy. We're stuck in a space of maybe true disappointment, of true, oh, I just wish it wasn't this way. And because we're stuck in what God didn't do, we're having a hard time moving on to see what God might actually be about to do. And Mary is with Jesus, and they cry together, and it's this beautiful moment. And then Jesus does something that she couldn't even fathom. She brings Lazarus, he brings Lazarus back to life. And that question hits me over, what would you do if you knew without a doubt, without one speck of doubt, that Jesus was who he said he was? That he came because he loved you. He came because he wanted nothing to separate you from the love of God, and he gave his life for you. What would your life look like? What would your life reflect? Because you know what I believe? I believe without a doubt, Mary believed after that, Jesus was who he said he was. He wasn't just a good, good friend. He wasn't just a good man or a prophet, but he was the Savior he was the son of God, and she did not have a doubt in her mind who he was. And in the next chapter, John 12, this is where I want to be today. In John 12, Mary does something that is so beautiful, and I want to wrap our heads around it because I believe if we follow it, it's going to help us live a life of true joy. I believe that we have to stop thinking about our lives just in this small moment of time. But I think we have to start opening our lives to the eternal. I think there has to be an eternal outlook on life where we stop saying, all this stuff is boggling me down because really, ultimately, what matters? Ultimately, when I'm fighting with my husband, is this going to matter in the long term of life? When I'm struggling with my kids, is this going to matter? Is this fight going to matter? Is it going to make a difference and grow their soul, grow their values, or is it not going to make a difference? You see, when you put the eternal view on, the eternal perspective, I promise you some of the stuff you're worrying about, it's a waste of time. Some of it is just dragging you down, and you know what it's doing? It's just sucking all the joy out of your life. And it's the idea of let's get an eternal perspective. Let's say that God is real. Let's say that he is who he says he is. Let's say that Christ did come for you. Then what will your life reflect? If I have the eternal picture, this is so morbid, but one day, not one day, most of my life, I always would think when Jacob and I were in our worst times, I always talk about how terrible we were. We're madly in love. No girl has ever loved her husband the way I love this man. And a lot of you can attest to that. But we were in just horrible times. I used to think he would leave the house, and I would think to myself, if it was my last day or if it was his last day, would I be proud of how I reacted? Would I be proud of who I was and how I was living? And it gave me an eternal perspective it didn't give me just a now in this fight and he said something rude or I said something crappy. Like, it didn't give me that stuck view, stuck view. It gave me an eternal view of like what truly matters. And in John 12, we get to see this beautiful picture of Lazarus and Jesus. There's this party in Bethany. Um, now, this, for, this story, or one like it, shows up in all of the Gospels. And... There's a debate on, is this all one story? Is it all one story that each of the Gospels, so Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they each tell this story? Is it two separate stories, 
Or is it three stories? So there's like some debate against the scholars. I'm gonna be very honest, my verdict is still out. I'm not 100% sure um, because the stories are very similar. But today we're gonna work in the aspect of there were two versions of the same story. So the one version is what we're gonna talk about, John 11. And in this, Mary, Lazarus, Martha, there's this banquet, they're throwing this feast, and it's for Jesus. And guys, it's about a week before Jesus dies. And there's this huge feast, and people are kind of coming from everywhere because they hear Lazarus and Jesus are gonna be there. When someone's raised from the dead, people wanna see. You know what I'm saying? You heard someone died and they came back to life, we're gonna go see, you're gonna tell your friends, and you're gonna be like, he's here. You're gonna to wanna to talk to him. You're gonna to wanna to see their experience. So there's this dinner going on and Lazarus is at the table with Jesus. They're reclining, they're eating. Some of the disciples are there. Martha, doing what she does best, serving. She's just serving people. She's just making sure they're full, making sure they have what they need. And then Mary shows up. And I love this because every single time we see Mary, she is at the feet of Jesus. Literally, every time you see her in the Bible, she's at the feet of Jesus. And I just wonder what was going on in her heart in this moment. Because she did something that no people do. You see, her brother just had died, and what, um, what people would have done back then is they would have prepared the body with expensive oils. They would have prepared it and wrapped it tight. And so... Her brother had just died, so I'm guessing they used the very best that they had on him. And Jesus brought him back to life, so it was a beautiful thing. But Mary walks in with a very expensive ointment. She walks in with ointment that probably cost a working man an entire year's salary. And some scholars believe that maybe it was her dowry, but I believe if she was going to use the oils that she had, it would have been used on her brother. So I believe she went and she bought this special ointment just for Jesus. And she goes in this room where the likelihood of her being judged and criticized was extremely high. She goes in this room and she falls at the feet of Jesus. And she opens this, anoint, this ointment. And she pours it on his feet. And now most of us know in Bible times they used sandals. Their feet were probably dirty. Most likely they would have had someone wash your feet at the door. In one of the stories, we know that Jesus' feet, they didn't even give him water to wash his feet. So I don't know in this moment how dirty his feet are. But she gets down and she puts this very expensive ointment. Let's just call it oil. It was nard. And it smelled the whole entire house up. It smelled sweet and spicy. It overpowered the smell of the food. And I believe everything got quiet. And she gets at his feet, and the aroma is filling the air. And what does Mary do when she knows without a doubt that God is real? Without a doubt that Jesus is who he says she is. She gets at the feet of Jesus. In an act of ultimate humility. In an act of, I don't care what people think. I don't care who criticizes me. This is my Savior. She puts oil on his feet, and then she takes her hair, and she wipes it. Imagine that oil being thick in her hair. I imagine whatever dirt was on his feet is now in her hair. And I imagine her sitting there in the ultimate act of worship. In the ultimate act of just total surrender. And I wonder to myself, what aroma am I leaving in the lives of others? What aroma surrounds me? What aroma fills my home? What aroma fills this church? 
What aroma fills the heart of the people that I love? And can I tell you, I believe that joy is a focus, but I also believe it's a position. And Mary, in this ultimate act of deep surrender, gets down on her feet, gets down on her knees. I was thinking, if you were going to wipe someone's feet, your head is literally probably going to come close to touching the ground. In this ultimate act of deep surrender, the aroma of joy, the aroma of worship, the aroma of true beauty filling this place. Church, I call us to focus on joy. I call us to have the eternal perspective and say, my focus, okay, there are hard things. There's pain sometimes that I don't even know how to deal with. But sometimes I can get laser focused. I can get stuck in my pain, in my world, in my regret, in my shame, and I can get stuck. But the saying of move to the joy is the idea of I am moving my focus from the pain, from me, from the worry, from the anxiety, to the one who is ultimately in control. I am moving my focus from what I cannot control to the one who is in control. And I want to leave an aroma that fuels people. I want to leave an air of, man, there was something special because Sarah walked into the room. My family's better because Sarah showed up. That sounds so narcissistic that I'm saying my own name. (laughs) You know what I'm saying, though? Like, I want the heartbeat of my life to leave something beautiful behind. I don't want to be stuck in the unknowing. I don't want to be stuck in the pain. I want to be alive in the joy and the beauty of God. The joy and the beauty of not doubting, but believing and trusting with all my heart that you are who you say you are. That I will worship you without caring what others think. That I will praise your name. I'll get my hair dirty if that's what it takes. I'll get my feet dirty. I'll get anything dirty because I am in it. I am in it to win it because you are my God. But then the robber of joy joy appears. The, The life sucker of all your joy sitting there at the table. Judas. And he looks at her, and he says, what are you doing? You could have sold that perfume and made a ton of money and given it to the poor. And in other pieces of scripture, you hear some of the disciples got in on it with him. Yeah, what are you doing? The act of joy, the act of worship and surrender was robbed because of a focus. You see, some people might say, and I think the disciples didn't know what was actually going on in Judas's heart. But some of the disciples would be like, that is, that's, you know, let's help the poor. Let's be with the poor. But John is so clear in chapter 12. John is writing this later in life, and he's saying, I don't want you to think that that was the motive of his heart. I don't want you to think that he was being honest and sincere, and that was to help the poor. He was a thief. He took care of the money bags, and every chance he got, he would steal money out of the money bags. He was a thief of money. He was a thief of joy. N.T. Wright said my favorite line. He said, he knew the price of everything, but the value of nothing. Ho, ho, ho. He knew the price of everything. He said, he looked at that nard, and he said, that's $300 worth. He knew the price of everything, but the value of nothing. And the critic robbed the joy. I got to be very honest. Some of us, we're the critic. Some of us, we watch and we see and we judge. Some of us, we we don't want to be vulnerable with what we're actually feeling so we critique and we judge and we nitpick and we bring out the ugly my husband was gone and the girls and i were on this lovely walk (laughs) it was lovely 
But we were on this walk, and I was like, man, you know, I'm thinking about this sermon, and I think about sometimes, like, my heart just needs, like, time with Daddy. Like, I just, I want to sit down. I want to have conversation. I want to go to dinner, just the two of us. Um, we, our time is full a lot. We, we help people sometimes on the weeknights, and um, he runs a company, so he's very, very busy. I'm helping lead the church in a kind of way that I never saw coming, but, like, like we're busy. And so sometimes my heart longs to just connect with them. But instead of being vulnerable and saying that, I'll be the critic. And I'll be like, are you ever going to sit down? Do you care about anybody else but yourself? Oh. Attack of the character. But my heart is just longing for his company. Women, I just want to talk to you for a minute. I feel like we do this. I feel like this is something inside of us that we can do. If you don't, God bless you. All the men have a smile on their face. You knock it off right now, men. But ladies, I feel like sometimes the vulnerability, it's like we cover it with something. And instead of moving to the joy, moving to the vulnerability, putting your focus on where your heart really is, we cover it with a critique. Men, you're just as equal to blame, so don't even try it. Come on. You're just as equal. But listen, there is, there is a robbing of our life. There is a robbing of the joy of the people around us when we sit and we critique, when we sit and we judge, when we don't just be vulnerable and put it out there, but instead cover it up by a hard heart. We rob ourselves of joy. We rob ourselves of life. And Judas, he didn't know this, but it was his last week on earth too. He couldn't even live with himself. And it was last week on earth. And I just call to us as a church, can we drop the criticism? Can we drop the ugliness on social media? Can we drop the ugliness wherever it might lurk? Wherever we say, I'm not that person, but I know somebody, like knock it off. It's inside every single one of us. And I believe Mary is showing us this true example of worship, this true example of surrender and joy. And I don't know about you, but that's what my heart longs for. Something inside my soul says, yes, I want a life like that. I do not want a life like Judas. I don't want the critique to rob me, rob my marriage, rob my kids, rob the staff, rob the church of anything. I want to have an open heart that surrenders to God and says, yes, use me. I am moving to the joy. I'm moving from my focus from what hurt to who you are. Because ultimately, Father, you are in control. And ultimately, at the end of the day, I know and I have an assurance that God is going to make it okay. Somehow, some way. And you know what he says? He looks down at Mary, who's cleaned his feet, who has showed the act, ultimate act of surrender and love. And he looks at the crew, and he's like, leave her alone. Can you hear the words of your heavenly Father? Can you hear the words of Christ ringing out to you? Leave them alone. Friends, them could be someone in your life. It could be someone that is across the way, but you're still critiquing. And man, unfortunately, it can be yourself. You can rob yourself of joy because you, you rob your own mind, your own voice, your own inner sense of well-being because you're filling it with the ugly. You're filling it with lies, and you're not even giving yourself a break. Move to the joy in your mind and say, that's enough. I'm going to turn my focus. I'm going to shift my focus. He said, leave her alone. You see, I think something in Mary knew something. We see all throughout the Gospels that Jesus would tell people, 
that he was going to die. We would see that he would say things, and these were their good friends. And I believe she did this beautiful thing out of love and moving to the joy and out of worship. But I believe maybe in her heart, she heard Jesus say that he was going to die, and she believed it. And I believe she, she did this as an act to maybe prepare him beforehand. Have you ever heard the idea of like people will um, share everything at the funeral and you're like, why wouldn't you share that before everyone died so they could hear it? I feel like this was Mary's act. And you know, I was talking with my dad about this yesterday or a couple days ago. And we were talking about what so there's four versions of this story, and if there's two versions, because one happens in, I think, Galilee, and one happens in Bethany. If there's two versions, do you think it's possible that at some point, either Jesus told Mary, or that Mary heard of another Mary who sat at the feet of Jesus, who in her sins and in the ugliness of life, she she felt so overwhelmed that she went to the feet of Jesus with expensive oil and she wiped his feet with her tears. She wiped her hair on his feet and she showed this ultimate act of love and praise and worship. Do you think Lazarus' sister Mary maybe heard about this? And do you think maybe Jesus could have said how much that meant to him? With that act of joy and worship, do you think he could have said somewhere along the way, that was a really special moment? And in the beauty of her mind, Mary, Lazarus' sister says, that was special to him. I want to do it too. Do you know that your life is a reflection? Your life is a reflection of what God is doing and if we let our joy be robbed by the critic, if we let our joy be robbed by the hardships of life, then what are we reflecting into the world? Are we reflecting any show of the goodness of God? Because I believe the goodness of God is chasing after us and we've gotta see it. We gotta be alive to feel it. We gotta be in the moment to say, I love him, I surrender to him, and I am moving to the joy and my focus is on him. Your life is a reflection of what you believe. Teddy Roosevelt has a famous speech, and in it, it's called The Man in the Arena. And here's what it says. It's not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust, sweat, and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes short again and again, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at the best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, and who at the worst, if he fails, at least he fails while daring greatly so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who neither know victory nor defeat. I call you to just dare greatly, to live a life and move to the joy. Switch your focus on who God is. Switch your focus to the worship and the reality of the life that he's given us. Believe that he is who he says he is. Believe that ultimately, somehow, some way, that it will all work itself out for the honor and the glory of him who is with us. Believe that he is with you. He will never leave you. That he loves you. And that he is a God of hope. Put your focus on him. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I love you. I love that you are brilliant in all your ways. I love that the scripture is so full of just joy, joy, joy. It's everywhere I look, Father, and I believe you are a God of joy. So I pray that joy will not just be a choice, but it'll be a focus, Father, that we will focus on what is good and healthy and right. 
and we will move away from the pain and the hurt and all the things that are keeping us stuck. I pray that we will believe you without a doubt that you are our good, good Father, and even through the pain, even through the hardships that life brings, that you are going to work it all out for your honor and your glory. I pray that you will radiate your peace, that you'll radiate your hope to everyone who is listening, Father, and I pray your name will be lifted high. In your son's name we pray, amen.